I'm good. All right, let's do this. All right, everybody. Thanks for uh, thanks for coming back. And um, uh, basically, after this, we're gonna get back into the tracks uh, for the rest of the afternoon. And um, I think we're closing. Ben 10 will be likely done 6:30-ish, and then we'll. Anybody who wants to uh, continue hanging out with us, uh, we have the downstairs B side again for. Uh, we're bringing some food, and we have that till nine uh, for all of our, you know, the private little party after party. So, without further ado, John Strand. All right, everybody. Um, so please don't get angry about the rock out front. Um, it's my theme music. Uh, it's kind of like Shaft. I have it going in the background. So if you hear angry punk rock, that's all good. I'm, I'm perfectly fine with that. The other thing I'd like to say is uh, big thanks to uh, B-Sides Cleveland for having me out here um, and Trusted Sec for kicking this off and more importantly Dave Kennedy. I don't know if Dave's here yet or not, um, but Trusted Sec is kind of, I look at them as that you know, kind of got frenemies, right? They're a competing pen testing firm to Black Hills Information Security, but to be completely honest, we think Trusted Sec kicks so much ass that they actually do pen testing on Black Hills Information Security. We trust them, all right? Yeah. So, uh, so please, 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 if you guys have any questions and you're looking into good companies, if we lose and we lose to Trusted Sec, we know that people get good work. And <laughs> kind of another note on that, finish that out. If you're like, why the hell would he say that, man? He sucks at capitalism. Um, <laughs> the fact is that if you look in the industry right now, there's not a lot of really good pen testing firms or security firms, period. Uh, the pen test puppy mills are winning. There's all of these different kind of mergers and acquisitions and things are coalescing all these all together. And there's only a few of us left. And Trusted Sec is one of those few that we absolutely love along with uh, like in Guardians, who we think is a fantastic company as well, and there's some others. All right, so I want to go into this presentation. Um, so Mr. Einstein was attributed with a quote uh, for insanity. Basically it was, his definition of insanity was what? doing the same thing over and over again and somehow expecting different results. And part of the reason why I did that talk over lunch is I wanted to kind of spend some time talking about the security products that are out there and how fundamentally broken they are actually and how we need to start thinking completely different about computer security and what it is we're doing in this industry. Because every year, if you look at what we're doing, we're doing the same thing again and again and again and again and we somehow expect that there's going to be different results. Now you're going to get a vendor that's going to be a next, next, next generation AV vendor that finally they're going to be able to stop all of these different attacks against the organization. You have groups like Silence, whose marketing is an absolute complete train wreck, and they say that they will stop 100% of attacks. You have Barracuda, which why the hell haven't we beat up on Barracuda yet? Um, we beat up on Silence. I know we have some people here from Trusted Sec. We need to get together and really beat up on Barracuda because those guys are bad. I mean. They've been out saying for years, stopping 100% of all attacks, and that's complete garbage. But we keep buying that garbage because if you're looking at us as far as human beings, these are our tools. And these are the tools that are being handed to us. And these are the only tools that we're being given. So we tend to think that these are the only tools that are available to our disposal. And we're not really thinking fundamentally different about how we can approach trying to secure our networks. I have this chart. It's an old chart. But the percentages haven't changed. I'd like to start out with this chart because it really level sets detection methods in organizations. And let's, let's go through this. This is from Verizon Data Breach Report a long time ago. They went through and they took all the breaches that they worked, and they went through and they categorized how these breaches were actually detected. How did these organizations find out that they were actually compromised? Unrelated third party, outside third party, 34%. Then you drop down to fraud detection is 24%. Customers, customers picking up the phone, calling you and saying, I, I think you're compromised. Why? Because you have a duck smoking crack on your website. <laughs> like, no, that was, that was intentional. OK, all right. Law enforcement picking up the phone and saying they compromised you. Actor disclosure going out on pastebin. And like, here's all of your sensitive records. We win. You suck. Oh, dual rules. 7%. Unknown. I'm going to come back to unknown, OK? I'm going to come back to unknown, but I got a question about unknown. How the hell does that happen? How is it you pick up the phone, you call Verizon, and you're like, we've got a breach. And they're like, how do you know? I don't. I'm going to come back to it here in just a little bit. I don't know if you guys, anybody here from Binary Defense? Anybody here from Binary? We saw some people from Binary. They, all right, we're now going to compete with Binary Defense. Um, I'm sorry, but we're going we're to compete against you. 
I, I'm, I apologize, I'm going to come back to it, but you should be afraid. Very, very afraid binary defense. All right. So reported by users is 4%. Financial audit, 3%. No, she's like, I'm not. <laughs> I'm a good salesperson. I'm not going to give into this talk. Um, network intrusion detection systems, 1%. One. Log review, 1%. That's your SIM. 1%. Your host-based IDS, which is your AV, 1%. That's where you're spending all of your money, folks. And together, they're 3%. It's garbage, <laughs> okay? A lot of people are like, well, you know, if you actually implement it correctly, um, it's actually pretty effective. Garbage, <laughs> okay? It's absolute, complete garbage. We are doing things incorrectly in this industry. So right now, here today, I want to talk about our, our competitive product to binary defense, okay? It's, it's going to be awesome. It's going to be five times better than any product you guys have. We're going to name this product unknown. <laughs> At regular random intervals, I'm going to pick up the phone and call you. And I'm going to say, you're breached. And you're going to say, how do you know? I don't. Brilliant. <laughs> five times more effective than your IDS or your SIM or anything that you guys have. Just feel free to come and throw money at me later, OK? Coming for you guys. <laughs> Coming for you guys. Watch it. We're going to take you guys down. All right. So if we're looking at a lot of, all joking aside, if we're looking at the vast majority of what we're doing in security, we're building static walls. And there's a bunch of problems with static walls. None the least of which, whenever we're looking at static walls, is that they're static. You know exactly where they are. They're not doing anything interesting. They're not doing anything proactive. So if you're taking a look at the vendors that you actually have in your organization, if you look at your, your AV, you look at your firewall, you look at your SIM, you look at whatever product you're dealing with, you are not a unique special snowflake. There are hundreds of other organizations that are buying that exact same product. And do you think that the Russians or the Chinese or the Israelis or the NSA could actually purchase that exact same product? And find out exact no, 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 or not no export control laws, yeah. <laughs> Do you know how hard it is as a pen testing firm? They give us these things and it's like, what are your export control laws for crypto? It's like, well, we pretty much just use it for our command and control to evade IDS, so yeah, we use that. Um, we use that all the time. And yeah, we have to answer these questions and it's hard. So our, our, we have these static defenses and they can be bypassed. And what's so hard is people don't understand how easy it is to bypass them. At no point do I get on the phone with Dave and like, hey Dave. He's like, yeah, did you guys test silence? Oh! Dave, you okay? Yeah, yeah, dude, dude, we were testing against silence. They're dead. And it hurt Larry's feelings. We couldn't get by it. Were they running McAfee too? Oh my god, yes! <laughs> They were running them both. Who the hell does that? <laughs> what are we going to do? I'm going out of business. I'm done. I've got to pack up everything. We're out of here. That's why it's so important to understand that there are weaknesses in these things, OK? So once a year, we do sacred cash cow tipping. Um, I've got a joke I, I tell because it's an inappropriate joke. And I was hanging out with Adrian. And uh, I thought inappropriate jokes would be fun. Um, so a lot of times when you present, there's two things you're never allowed to present about. You're not allowed to talk about religion or politics. Um, so I'm going to do the religion thing now. <laughs> and some of you guys have heard this joke, but honestly, I only got so much time to come up with so many jokes, right? I get like three good ones a year, and I've been milking this one for a while now. Um, so years and years and years ago, my, my wife took me to, this is right whenever we started in corporate America, and it was like in 2000, and she was an engineer, and I'm going to stay away from that speaker right there, because it doesn't like me, and it doesn't like you either. Um, <laughs> And uh, we went to her company's uh, Christmas party. And she's like, don't embarrass me. How many of you guys have had the don't embarrass me conversation? Because you're in IT, right? That's what we do, right? Like, don't embarrass me. So we sit down at this table, and you have a choice of chicken, fish, or steak. And I'm like, oh, I want to have steak. And I'm like, yeah, that sounds fantastic. And I, I tell this joke. You guys know whenever you're driving through the countryside? And you have kids in the car, and they see cows off in the field. What do the, what do the kids like to do? Moo! Not my kids. My kids go. Tss. 
because that's the sound they make on daddy's grill. All right? And I'm sitting at this table, and we have these two people that work with my wife um, who are very good friends of ours, and uh, they became good friends. And um, their names are Namita and Sanjeev. They're from India. And they look at me, and they're like, we consider cows to be sacred. My wife is holding onto my hand, and I swear she's breaking bones, right? <laughs> it's crushing my hand. And uh, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, what do I do? And all of a sudden, it hits me. And I'm like, nah, it's cool. I'm Catholic. We eat our God every Sunday. And, <laughs> and Namita and Sanji, they look at me, and they're like, OK, you can party with us. They were just busting my chops, right? So with this cash cow tipping, the reason why we do this every year, we bypass all the major antivirus engines an afternoon before we actually go public with it. We do PowerPoint slides, we do videos, and yes, I'll make all this available to you. And we do it because it is ever so important for every single one of you to be able to go back and talk to management and show them exactly how defenses can be bypassed. Because security is about architecture. It is not about one specific product that is going to stop every single attack in your organization. And I know this because you guys you guys are saying the exact same thing at work, but you still have a lot of managers that are saying, well, you know, we talked to these guys from, uh, from Logarithm, and uh, they were in suits. They were fantastic suits, very nice suits, and their hair was perfect. And uh, I think we're going to trust these guys because they got a product that's a silver bullet, and dear God, if we can't trust you know, these guys with silver bullets, who can we trust? We need to take down the silver bullets because it's all about architecture. We need to push it as much as possible to architecture. And really, one of the main reasons why our current strategies are not working is because we're trying to do the exact same crap that we were doing five to 10 years ago. If we magically got into a time machine and we go back five, six years ago, and we're like, hey, what should we do to protect our networks? Well, you should patch, use AV, use IDS, IPS. That's what the vast majority of people would say. You come to today and people are just getting started. It's patch, AV, IDS, IPS. If they are asking that question, there's no way in hell they're going to understand user behavioral analytics. There's no way in hell that they're going to understand like higher level segmentation. It's really hard, but we keep on trying to sell people the exact same products and the exact same ideas again and again and again. And this is a horrible, horrible trend in this industry. I'm trying to form together in my head, I want to present at DerbyCon this year, and I've got this idea, it's kind of this nebulous idea of a talk, but one of the things I want to drive in this presentation that I'd like to give, and I'll talk about it a little bit here, is if you guys notice the never-ending push by vendors to push you out of a job, do you guys see the, do you guys see the marketing? Do you see the trends? It's end-to-end -end automation for incident response. We automatically detect, contain, and eradicate threats in your network. Single pane of glass. Anyone seen that in marketing propaganda? You can get your entire security vis visibility in a single pane of glass. Sounds pretty good. Threat intelligence. Let's talk about threat intelligence for a couple of seconds. Threat intelligence is garbage. Sorry, it is. There's people that are like, well, no, threat intelligence. No, garbage. I have never seen a company that's like, threat intelligence has sub substantively changed the way that we approach our network in the right ways. But all of these things, all of these things, and that's a whole other presentation, but all of these things are really kind of hooked and based in a couple of things that are working against us, you and me, the human beings in this industry. Number one, if anybody's talking about single pane of glass, they are oversimplifying security because managers believe that what you are actually doing is something that can be simplified to a single dashboard in the organization. Do you guys understand that? They're not really selling it to you. They're selling it to the managers because their managers, your managers, want a product that'll simplify security to one screen. How many of your enterprises are over 50,000 users? Do you think there's any way in hell that they'll ever be able to simplify to one screen all the security in your environment? No. Huh? It would be a really big one, right? <laughs> it's like a movie theater and it's made up of hundreds of other screens, right? But they're trying to sell that because that is something management wants. They want to automate you because you make them uncomfortable. They want to automate you because you are expensive and security is just getting more expensive. So the more we automate, the cheaper it gets. And they think that it's something simple because clearly these people are idiots that are trying to secure our network. If I can just get a single pane of glass that tells me what I need to know, 
They're oversimplifying the problem. Does that all make sense to everybody? And, and it's kind of a hard thing. I need to find a better way to articulate it. But these are the pressures against you and me doing our jobs effectively. And with threat intelligence, just briefly, let me explain like threat intelligence. With the human psyche, whenever we're talking about risks, whenever we're talking about threats, if you go through the evolution of human beings, when we discovered that we shouldn't eat a flower, Ugg ate the flower, Ugg dropped dead. And everybody else looked at him and they're like, ugh, don't eat that. <laughs> that flower didn't change, right? It doesn't change for hundreds if not thousands of years, right? So we learned, don't eat that flower. We learned that this big kitty with really long teeth, don't cuddle with that. And that cat, well, it didn't change, but eventually went extinct. But our concept of risk and threats, threats were very static, OK? So as a human being, whenever you're thinking of risks, you're thinking of, I'm not going to touch the frying pan. Why? Because the frying pan was hot. I learned the frying pan was hot by doing what? Touching it. Did the frying pans evolve and start looking different and start enticing you over with like, you know, like Nintendos? It's like, oh, there's a Nintendo. Shit! Oh, God! Frying pan! Oh, how dare you! But that's how we look at risk, right? That's how we look at threats. Threats are something that's static, that can be categorized. Once we categorize them, we avoid those things and we continue leaving. You go to blacklist AV. Blacklist AV is we can identify malware. This is what malware looks like. If we don't let that run, we'll be safe. You go to threat intelligence. What we're going to do is we're going to look exactly what the fuzzy panda number 42 does. And we're going to detect what the fuzzy panda 42 does. We're going to identify them and we'll be able to do attribution for fuzzy panda 42. Whenever you look at the CIA documentation, when you look at the NSA documentation, they talk specifically about how can we make ourselves look like Fuzzy Panda 42 so we get attributed to be someone else. The point is the existing human understanding of risk and threat is not adequately set up to be able to effectively detect and deal with attacks that are moving forward and constantly evolving. So whenever they're selling you these things, really, really complicated, awesome blacklists, they're preying on one of your base understandings of threats in order to sell you a product. Does that make sense? Okay, that's something that's really high level. Very, very quickly, I can move on now. But that's something that's important to understand. And all of this is coming down to one simple concept. And that concept is we're going to have to be active in our networks. Single plane of glass, garbage. End-to-end -end automation, garbage. Artificial intelligence being able to handle all the security. For the love of God, they can't come up with a Twitter bot that doesn't devolve into racist tirades within an hour. Do you really think that they're going to have artificial intelligence down to the point where it's going to completely handle all the security for you anytime real soon? I think it's going to happen eventually, not for a while, and certainly not the way it stands now. So we want to talk about how do we actively look for advanced adversaries. And this boils down to, if you're a company like TrustedSec, if you're in Guardians, if you're BHIS, we can bypass actively um, your IDS, IPS, your AV, we're small firms. You damn well better believe that the Russians and the Chinese and the Israelis and the NSA can do it as well. So we have to find ways that we can actively start interacting with our network in order to effectively start dealing with these attacks. So what I want to do is also kind of put this in a nice little picture so you guys can see it. This is not hunting. No one ever came home and they're like, honey, I got a can of spam. I killed it myself. <laughs> So whenever you talk to vendors, they're like, we're going to automate the hunt. Garbage. They're going to look for specific signatures of specific threat actors. And they're going to try to find those on your network. And you're like, oh, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. Because that's the way my great, 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 great grandfather, Ugg, dealt with flowers. So clearly, that makes sense here whenever we're talking about indicators of compromise. So this is not hunting. So we spent some time. This started about three years ago. We sat down with a customer. And they're like, so you guys bypassed all of our products in our environment. And um, we want to know, would it be possible for you guys to come in and actually detect really advanced adversaries that are using many of the exact same techniques um, in our network? And we're like, how hard can that be? OK, really hard, apparently, <laughs> and really expensive. So we sat down, and we started having conversations. And I have a bunch of like, like high-end math geeks. and. Um, <laughs> They'll sit there and they'll start having uh, conversations about discrete fast Fourier transforms and K-boxes and all of these different things. And uh, I'm like sitting there in the room and they're talking back and forth. And then they'll stop, they'll look at the table, and then they'll get out crayons. And <laughs> they'll go up to a big sheet of paper and they're like, John, this is how math works. 
let's talk about math. And I'm like, oh God, oh God, oh God. Um, so what we started developing years ago was RETA, Real Intelligence Threat Analytics. And it was named after my mom. And as we like to say in the read meme, John's mom was taken. Um, so we named it RETA um, after my mother. And that's a long story I don't want to go into now. Um, so whenever we talk about RETA, I want to first talk about a couple of different things that I think are important. Um, so first and foremost, let's go file, let's go new, let's do a blank presentation because that's cool. I'll delete this. So one of my least favorite jokes, Black Hills Information Security, people get into arguments about what text editor to use. Any of you guys get into arguments about text editors at work? I want to party with that guy. Um, so you'll sit here and have the argument, it's like, oh, well, everybody should use VI because that's what normal sane people would use. Not, you know, you're going to use VI because it's always there, right? And if you haven't played video games where you have to use home road and navigate, you don't know how to use VI, you use the arrow keys with Vim. That's sad. And then you have people that are like, um, no, 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 you got to use Emacs because they're like pirates and they have to have something that does everything for them. And then you got people like, like, like Nano, apparently. And you get into these arguments and we're arguing on IRC because I'm old. <laughs> and it's like, everyone's like, switch to Slack, John. And we still use IRC. We tried using Slack and then Slack got compromised and all of our testers disappeared. Um, so we're on IRC arguing about this and Ethan Robish is like, I'm sitting there, I like VI because the guy's there. I'm explaining, he's like, that's absolute garbage, John. Your favorite editor is PowerPoint. I'm like, oh, god damn, man. So fired, so fired. All right, so here we go. Um, so we're going to talk about artificial intelligence because it's important and Rita uses it, which I know for a lot of you in this room, as soon as I mention artificial intelligence, your BS meter starts going off. Whose BS meter just went off? Okay, good, all of you. That's fantastic. I'm a little bit nervous because Wendy's went off. <laughs> I'm a little nervous here. All right, so before we start talking about algorithms, what I first want to talk about is, uh, did anybody study Plato in college? All right, so it turns out Plato was a computer scientist. Um, a brilliant, com it was, no, I'm not joking. So the whole essence of what Plato talked about, we can talk about Kant too, but we're going to talk about Plato first. Plato had this idea that he was trying to get his head around, how the hell do we know things are the things that they are? For example, how does a human being know that that's a chair? This may seem simple, right? A lot of times it's very easy for people to kind of poo-poo it and be like, well, that's a chair. How do you know as a human being that this is, in fact, a chair? Um, it, it's a rhetorical question, okay? So <laughs> in, in Plato's view, um, he had this idea that there was somewhere in the universe a perfect chair, an absolutely flawless chair. And somewhere this flawless chair existed, and absolutely everything that we saw of this chair was merely a shadow of that perfect chair. So we're merely staring in the cave, staring at shadows on the wall, never seeing what's real, but seeing shadow representations of what itself is real. That's actually computer science. Believe it or not, it is. So when we're talking about a chair, and we're talking about shadows and attributes, we can actually define aspects of that chair. And you mentally will look at that chair, and a whole bunch of those aspects of that chair will either be in existence or not existence. And very, very quickly, you'll t look at all of them and you'll say, yes, that is, in fact, a chair. We can actually use this whenever we're trying to identify malware in a network, okay? So that's what Rita does. And the math it actually uses is, here, let me bring it up. K means clustering. This is the exact math that we're using in Rita. There is your formula. It's, uh, it's pretty much self-explanatory. <laughs> All right, so let's go through what's actually going on. So whenever we're looking at about an attribute of, of malware, all right, and I'm just going to do three here for a second. If we're looking at the attributes of malware, we can identify what would be a perfect concept of those individual specific attributes of malware, okay? For each one of these attributes, there's going to be a perfect definition. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to look at malware from the perspective of beaconing. How does that malware actually communicate out? And does it have consistent attributes that we can identify? So let's go through each of them. Um, on this top one, we're going to call it interval. Interval. Now, interval is important. The reason why interval is important is a lot of malware, not all malware, not all malware, but a lot of malware will have very consistent 
intervals. It'll beacon out at every two seconds. It'll beacon out every one second. It'll beacon out every five, six. I don't care. It's going to be a consistent interval or a very close to consistent interval. Is everyone with me so far? Okay. We're all good. So we can have that interval. So what we can do is we can look at all the connections that are made. Oops, wrong way. I'm going to make a quick cluster, <laughs> which sounds horrible, actually. All right, I'm going to take that. We're going to copy it. We're going to paste it a whole bunch of times. Then we're going to stack it on top of each other like this so it looks like a clustered interval. All right, so the closer you get to the center right here, that's zero. That defines an absolutely perfect interval, all right? However, no malware out there does an absolutely perfect interval. There's going to be jitter. It's going to shake a little bit. It's not going to be completely perfect. However, you are going to see that you have a cluster. That's what k-means clustering does. It looks at the attributes of every single one of the different connections that are leaving your environment, the inside host talking to an external host, and it's beaconing at a very consistent interval. And we can identify that, and we can say, we have a cluster. They're not perfect, but there is, in fact, a cluster that we can draw a circle around. Is everyone with me so far? Everyone's good? Haven't lost anyone? Awesome. The next thing that we can do is we can identify based on data size. Now, data size does the exact same type of math, but instead of actually looking at the connection intervals, it's going to look at the size of the connections. So let's say that you have malware that is randomizing its interval. And even then we can detect it. We'll talk about cutoffs here in a second. But if the data size every time that malware beacons out is 2K, then I can look and I can say every time your system communicates outbound to the internet, to this particular IP address in Estonia or Kazakhstan or like um, DigitalOcean or whatever, every single time it makes a connection out, it's always 2K. And that's a beacon saying, are there any commands? Yes, no, maybe so. And then it receives a response. Does that make sense to everybody? All right? So we can look at it in data size. The next way that we can look at it is we can also look at it in, um, we can also look at it in connection time. Now with connection time, how long is that connection established before it dies? So if you have a beacon that's randomizing data size, you have a beacon that's randomizing the connection interval, but every single time it actually makes a connection, that connection is only alive for a second or two, and then it dies, that's another way that we can use k-means clustering to look for patterns within the noise to identify potential beaconing activity. Now these are just three. There's other ones that we have. We have skew. We also look for shelf cutoffs. So for example, if we were looking at an interval and we had like a truly random um, interval with a back door. Random is only random for so long. What's going to happen is that randomness that's going to exist is going to have a very, very, very hard cutoff at some point. Sorry, I can't even move these things. So it'll be randomized. Let's say that this is up to 10 seconds and it's randomized within 10 seconds. Do you see like right here? Go away. I know you're there, Magnifier. Right here, you have a very hard shelf cutoff. So with a lot of these randomization algorithms, you're going to have a point It's going to say randomize between 1 and 10 or 15 seconds or a minute. You're going to have a very hard shelf cutoff when nothing exists beyond that. You can actually find those shelf cutoffs too. So there's a number of ways to do this is what I'm getting at, but you can use this k-means clustering to do that analysis. Is everyone with me so far? All right. So now, whenever we're talking about Rita, Rita takes like five minutes to install in your environment. Um, you just simply go to... Black Hills InfoSec, there we go, projects, go to Rita, download it here, and it'll take you to our GitHub, and we just released version 1, um, and you run the install script, and it'll install the entire thing, including MongoDB and Bro. We use Bro as the, uh, as the uh, ingest engine, and I'll talk about that more here in a couple of seconds. But we sets up absolutely everything you need for a Rita sensor, and it sets it up in under five minutes. It needs a lot of memory. It needs a lot of CPU cores. The reason why is we're taking our bro logs that you guys ingest, and we're taking the connection log out of bro, and we are effectively going through and looking at every single connection as it relates with every single other connection within bro. That takes a lot of CPU cores and a lot of memory. We wrote this in Golang because Python is too slow for it. And I always have people afterwards that come up and like, well, Python isn't that slow. It is for this. It is for this. This needs multi-threading. It needs tremendous uh, bandwidth and high. It's 
trust me, go is the way to go um, with it. So it only takes a few minutes to run and uh, set it or to get it set up, and then you feed your bro logs into it. It can take hours to do the analysis. That's one of the things that's really, really important to understand. It's not a security product that kicks out something in five minutes. It's not because of the amount of data size analysis that you're doing is pretty huge. All right, so with that, let me show you kind of what it looks like here. Um, this is a system that I have Rita installed. So whenever it's done, um, Rita has the ability to kick out, um, uh, I can do like show beacons. This is my DNS uh, listing. I also have a VS agent listing. And it lists out all of the different connections that it saw and it gives you a score. And it kicks it out in a comma delimited format so you can import it into your own databases. So you guys can easily take this data and you can put it into an access or to an Excel spreadsheet. Um, so here's, it's got like source IP address, destination IP address, beacon score. It's got SKU score and a whole bunch of other things in it. You can also do it with a minus capital H. It'll actually give you each of the columns, what it actually does, so you can get an idea of each column. And then the final thing that it has, it also has an HTML output. And this is what the HTML report looks like. Um, so these are the two different backdoors that we did analysis with VS Agent on, or not VS Agent, with Rita. I'll start with VS Agent. So once you select it, you select the beaconings tab, and it lists out all of the different beacons. Now this is where this gets interesting, and this is why it takes a human being to work with it. That top one, the one at the very, very top, with a 998 score, that is VS Agent. Um, you have the internal source IP address, the external IP address is who VS Agent was actually talking to. And down here, you also have very, very, very strong beacon activities. The difference is those are Microsoft. Those are Google. Those are Dropbox. Uh, you also have the capability of using whitelisting. You can ingest a whitelist and filter all of them out. But check this out. So here we have VS Agent on the top. Look at the connections. So we have our VS Agent system made 8,636 connections in a 24-hour period. These other systems had very strong beacons but they only made 87, 102, 105 connections. Um, we also have long URLs and a bunch of other things too. So this is all free. You guys can set this up, you can run it. You feed a large data set, the web front end is going to puke on itself. That's why we give you the comma delimited so you can output it and then do further analysis on your own. Does that make sense to everybody? Cool beans. Um, it also does some blacklisted analysis. Uh, just basically it'll compare all of the different connections that were on the inside of your network that are making out external network connections, how many of your internal systems uh, made connections to systems that are known blacklisted, um, known blacklisted websites. And also do long connections and a bunch of other things. The next one I want to show you though is I would like to show you um, DNSCAT. DNSCAT is interesting because it doesn't show up real well on beacons because it's actually connecting to Google. However, we have an exploded DNS view and I love this. So what it's going to do is it's going to say .com there were uh, 12, what do we got? We got 1.2 million connections to .com. That's fine, we would expect that. And there were 32,281 subdomains associated with .com. We would expect that. But we also have Nanobot Ninjas. Nanobot Ninjas was visited 82,920 times, and there were 30,191 subdomains off of Nanobot Ninjas. Anybody here know DNS? Is that normal? No. <laughs> Dot com, we'd expect a whole bunch of different subdomains with something like as simple as nanobot ninjas. We would never expect that. And the reason why is every single one of the subdomains is randomly generated to force the DNS not to rely on the local cache, but make it go out for command and control. Um, and that's how you would actually detect an act. That's how you would actually detect a DNS backdoor. Because every time a DNS backdoor fires, it wants to connect all the way out. So it has to randomize something in the DNS query so it doesn't rely on the local cache. Um, so that's what we do um, for detecting those. Once again, how much does this cost? Zero. Don't charge anything for this. Um, so all of this math, k-means, k-clustering, the Golang binaries, absolutely everything, kicking it out to a standard uh, CSV file or an HTML file. A lot of people like the HTML file just to get their hands dirty with it. Costs nothing. The only thing you need is a box that's powerful enough to power it. And you will need a powerful box to do this type of analytics. And this isn't easy. And the reason why it's not easy, that we just don't buy a product that automatically does this, is because 
we can bypass those products. So there's this constant cat and mouse game at BHIS. We come up with a way to bypass the technology and then we come back to Rita and they're like, okay, how would we have detected that? And then we make sure that we got the math associated to try to detect it. Um, in a lot of ways, I know that this sounds funny, but in a lot of ways, this is kind of penance. I've been, I've been doing, like teaching for SANS and teaching offensive things for um, well over a decade now. And it's really bothersome for me. Like we talked about during lunch, we talked about GCAT. We wrote the first version of GCAT, Fight Bleeder took it over. And then that was used in uh, Ukraine power grid attacks. And it sucks whenever something you create is being used. It sucks whenever I have videos about bypassing AV and I get these questions. I want to break into my girlfriend's computer. Can you please help me bypass AV? It's like you missed the point, right? So a lot of this is penance. A lot of our tools that we release at BHIS are actually defensive in nature because they're tools that we don't see, we, we see a gap. We don't see people actually doing this. And we want people to start doing this. We think that that's important. And it's all, it's all open source and free. So whenever you started in computer security, what did you think it was going to be? Seriously, what did you, yeah, you thought it was going to be like hackers. It's exactly like that for, no, I'm joking. <laughs> I haven't skateboarded in years. I'd probably hurt myself. But we always had this vision. It would be like Hacker Man. We'd have a Nintendo Power Glove. We thought it would be like whatever crap TV show that is. Um, we'd be sitting down with, a, with an attractive member of the opposite sex sharing the same keyboard. <laughs> it never works, by the way. I've tried co-hacking with other people. It's like, here, scoot over. Let me help you. It's like, no, it doesn't, doesn't work. They're hacking our firewall with JavaScript. Well, duh. Um, but you had this vision, okay? You had this vision whenever you started computer security that it would be dynamic, it would be adversarial, be you the good person going up against the bad guy, right? You'd be hunting and tracking these attackers through cyberspace. You'd be actively, you know, like the posters where they always have these people that looks like looks like they're straight out of Price Waterhouse Coopers pointing at a computer screen. It's like, hmm, right there. That's no that one. Right there. And it didn't. Instead, what computer security has become, for a lot of you, has become a compliance chase, right? How many of you feel like you spend most of your time working on compliance documentation, arguing, hey, eight-character passwords are dumb, people, and they're like, well, according to the compliance standard, um, it's based on the NIST Inc. Green Book of 1985, you should have an eight-character password. Um, we, we're constantly fighting those things. Or if you're not working in compliance and you're an engineer, how many of you guys are like engineers and you work on incident response? You, know, you work on incident response. Do you realize that what our jobs has become an in incident response is clean up on aisle three? Like, Jim. Yeah. Susie clicked on a link. <laughs> Floor three, could you please clean that up? Oh, God. And you like grab the mop bucket and you're like, you know, you're not supposed to click on the links. Like, oh, yeah, I didn't know. I just clicked on it. It looked legit. It was a, it was a cat and it was cute. And, and, you, and you clean the malware off, and then you go back down into the basement, because that's where we all are, right? And, and then you wait for the next call. That's, that's what we've become. And that sucks, right? That's horrible. I mean, we have this idea of us being dynamic hackers and breaking into things, but, but it really, even, even pen testing, there's a lot of documentation. There's a lot of report writing. There's a whole bunch where we have to learn what they have in their network to try to detect us. It's, it, it never really got to that point of us like tracing hackers through. We all want to be Clifford Stoll. We all want to see that bad guy eventually get caught and found, and it never really pans out that way. But we can do that. We can do that. So let's talk about that. So whenever we're talking about, I wish I had, I had more time to talk about more active defense things. Every once in a while, there's this thing that starts up on the internet. It's like, hacking back is wrong, boys and girls. You shouldn't do it. And it shuts down all active defense conversations, which is garbage. Um, there's somebody giving a presentation on active defense later on. Are they here? Um, fantastic, dude. I wish I could hang out and have a beer with you, but uh, we need a framework, right? Because right now, all of the active defense conversations are strike back. We're going to launch an attack against an IP address that's hacking us. You hacked me, I'm going to be able to hack you. I get to fire on your system because you. it, it, it doesn't work, okay? What we need is a range of options that aren't just pure hack back. But there's things that we can do. So I came up with an idea with Paul years ago. We came up with AAA, annoyance, attribution, and attack. And other people had other ideas. So annoyance is now cyber deception, which is fine. I guess I don't care. But it all ties back to ODA, observe, orient, decide, and act. 
In an adversarial relationship, whoever can observe, orient, decide, and act the fastest wins. And right now, the vast majority of our observations are based on signatures. The vast majority of our observations are threat intelligence feeds for attacks that happened last week, if they're pipe and hop fresh. And just so you know, talk to anybody from TrustedSec. Are they using the exact same attacks this week that they used last week? No, they're not. We change our attacks, we change our malware almost on a per engagement basis, and so are the adversaries. So our ability to observe sucks. Orient, yeah, once you get access to a workstation, Active Directory is like a hacker superhighway. I mean, it, it, I, I don't, I'm starting to really come around to the idea that maybe we just need to burn Active Directory for, to the ground and start over, because um, it's not providing any security. It's just basically, hey, where's all the uh, SQL servers? Oh, they're right there. Um, <laughs> Where's all the domain? There's the domain controllers. Can I get a list of all the users? Why, absolutely. Here you go. Um, <laughs> I would like to talk to every system in the environment. Why not? You're behind the firewall. What the hell? Active Directory makes that possible, folks. <laughs> and making decisions based on poor observations is not right. And that's what we're doing. We're buying a crap ton of products uh, based on poor observational data. And what sucks is a lot of our optional observational data comes from the vendors who are trying to sell us the product. So it becomes this really bad cycle. So another way to put it is detection time plus reaction time must be less than the amount of time it takes for an attacker to break into your organization. That's it. That is the formula. So if you don't have something that reduces your detection time or reduces your reaction time, you're hosed. Unfortunately, this requires observation. So something um, that hopefully he has in his presentation or will add to his presentation, um, there was this case. I'll go away from that case. Um, name of the case is Susan Clements Jeffrey versus Absolute Software. Susan Clements Jeffrey was a substitute teacher. She was teaching class, and one of her students said, hey, would you like to buy a, a, a cheap MacBook Pro? And she's like, how much? Student's like, 50 bucks. That sounds legit, right? So they made the transaction. I'm not making this up. They made the transaction at a school bus stop, which, once again, totally legit. Susan Clements Jeffrey takes this notebook computer home, props it open, logs in, and immediately start cyber sexting her boyfriend. The computer was stolen from another school district and they had LoJack or absolute software on it so they could track where that computer was and they could turn on the webcam. And they took multiple pictures of Susan Clements Jeffrey in multiple uh, various states of undress and sexual activity. Was it their computer system, right? It was, it was their system? Do you think that Susan Clements Jeffrey had a right to sue Absolute Software for turning on the camera on their computer system, the school district and the police force, to track where she was? Yes. Question is, the answer is no. They did not. Let me, let me read the, the legal jargon from the judge. So Judge Walter Rice ruled, it is one thing to cause a stolen computer system to report its IP address or its geographic location in an effort to track it down. It is another thing entirely to violate federal wiretapping laws to do so. The point on this is, if you're trying to do any type of attribution, get the location, get the IP address, that's fine. But if Susan Clements Jeffrey stole this computer and is now using that computer, she has a right to privacy for using that computer system. That means even if somebody is hacking you, you do not have the right to break the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to hack their computer system and violate the law. Two wrongs don't make a right is basically what it's getting down to. But geolocating its IP address and its location in an effort to track it down, perfectly cool. As far as this ruling, this is our case law. So we released the Active Defense Harbinger Distribution, um, ADHD. This is a tool that has all the different open source, yep, that's the name. You know what pissed me off though? Okay, so I named this ADHD and I thought that that was pretty crafty. Would it, what's that congressman that came up with the law? What's his name? He called his law ACDC. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> you know, sit and try and tell me that you didn't, never mind, whatever. Um, so, all right, so we break down annoyance, attribution, and attack. And I'm going to focus on attribution. Um, and let me show you really, really quick. I'll show you, oh, let's go like this. So everything in, um, everything in ADHD is free. It installs. And one of the things we have in it is Honey Badger. And what Honey Badger does is, <laughs> yeah, Honey Badger don't care. <laughs> Nasty. All right. So Honey Badger, as soon as you go to a website, this is just a demo page for the crazy natty ass Honey Badger, and it'll try to pop up this Java applet. And you can have Honey Badger clone a website for you. 
So what do you think would be a good website that would entice a bad guy to run the Java applet on that website? No one should run Java, let's be honest, right? But as a hacker, you see Java all the time, and you get excited whenever you see Java running on certain situations. What would be a situation where a bad guy would be excited to run Java? Yeah, maybe it's some monitoring software, security software in general. What else? <laughs> Anything with Oracle, right? <laughs> Anything at all. What about like uh, VPNs, SSL VPNs, possibly? What about VNC? Has anyone used the port 5900 filter in images.showdown.io? Isn't that horrifying? <laughs> it's like usually whenever I'm teaching class, I do that filter. It's like port 5900 on images. And then I'm like, OK, students, show me how long it takes for us to find a system that if we took over, we could kill people. And it's like the first page. They're like, that right there. That right there, that is a geothermal power plant. That, what the hell are these people doing in Switzerland? Um, so we can do that, and we actually have a nifty little tool called Jar Combiner that'll merge Honey Badger code with any other Java file that you use. You can take existing programs and backdoor them. Um, and, it, and this is awesome. So the problem is most uh, Java instances today just don't run. But if they do run, they, um, they will not run at all with a, ver with a self-signed certificate. Um, you have to actually go get a valid certificate from a real company. So we started up a company in Idaho called Verified Code Certificate, LLC. And it's a real company. And whenever we applied for the certificate, we dropped the LLC. So now it just says Verified Code Certificate. And if you run this, um, I hope I have internet connectivity. Nothing happens. I know you're probably expecting something dramatic. Um, but if you run it in the background, Here we go. Oh, that's the demo page again. In the background, it's recording the connections. Here we go. Go to demo pages. Go to demo pages. There we go. You can see where I was earlier. I was down in San Diego teaching. Whenever they ran that Java applet, and you can embed this inside of macros, inside of documents too. So is that pretty close? I mean, it put us it put us across the street, but you know what the hell? Um, it's funny whenever I demonstrate this to uh, people in DoD, they're like, "Yeah, that's close enough." <laughs> so we're here. There's the pin. Okay, so let's talk about attribution. Let's talk about attribution. All right, you can create internal websites that as soon as the bad guy goes to them, you can geolocate them. And so people are like, "What if their wireless card is off?" We can dump their wireless profile. Like with Windows, you can do NetSH, WLAN, show uh, networks, and you can dump all the networks. You can dump it with IW config and IW list. You can dump those configs, and we can still geolocate, maybe not where they're at right now, but where their house is, which I don't know, is that good enough for attribution? Is that okay with everybody? It's like, here's their Linksys router at home that they join. Good enough. At least we got an idea. Now, how this actually works is uh, if you look at the logs, it actually takes the connection data. And the system does a wireless site survey of all the different wireless access points that are near it, near it or it can also dump the, uh, the access points as well. And it takes all of that information, and it puts it into a JSON request to Google's um, geolocation API. And it sends that to Google. And Google receives this data, it comes back, and it says accuracy 36 meters, latitude, longitude, status of the service is OK. So what I love about this is you can put this in Excel spreadsheet. Don't ever, ever put macros if you're trying to track a bad guy in a Word document. The bad guys will see macros in Word documents and go, no, I'm not running that. If it's an Excel spreadsheet, they're going to run it. Why? Because macros almost always, people always running macros in Excel spreadsheets. If they want the data, they're going to run it. So what you can do is you can set up a system, set up a honeypot system, file share, have all of your systems mount to that file share, and anytime anyone opens an Excel spreadsheet, it geolocates them using Google. And if it ever goes to court, I'd love to see this. The judge's like, you found the location for this attacker. You violated the law. It's like, your honor, do you have a phone? Yes. It's doing this 15 times a second <laughs> using the exact same technology that we use to track the bad guys. So. This is all free. Let me show you kind of a little bit on um, ADHD. If you guys haven't seen it, every single one of the tools has step-by-step walkthrough instructions. 
Um, we have artillery right at the top from the fine people at uh, Trusted Sec. But every single tool that we have is in here. If you choose any one of them, it has step-by-step -step walkthrough for each tool. It has links on how to use it. It has a video walkthrough of how to use that tool. Basically, I'm trying to make this as easy for people to use as possible. I don't want there to be any barrier to entry whatsoever for starting to do active defense and trying to do some of these things in your organization. And there's dozens of tools here. The newer version of ADHD has about 20 more tools than what I have listed here. So there's quite a few that are there. All right. So that's uh, just quick attribution. There's a bunch more there. But it shows like, you know, we can actually start getting interactive with the bad guys, right? We can actually, instead of just waiting for cleanup on aisle three, we can actually go to your management and be like, um, the bad guy's right here at this address. It's funny, whenever you give that to law enforcement, we've done this with the FBI, we've also done this with Canadians, we're like, they're right there. A lot of times law enforcement's like a dog that just caught a wheel. They don't know what to do with it. They're like, what are we supposed to do with this? I, is that his house? Yeah, more than likely. What do, what do we do now? I'm like, mm, get a warrant, maybe? <gasps> yes, what, that's his house? <laughs> that's right there. He's right there, his name is Bill. Um, actually, I'll show you that here, just give me a second. So Tomes wrote this, uh, Landmaster 53, well, he's at BHIS, and we tracked a whole bunch of attacks against our websites, his websites, and my websites. We had attackers from Melbourne. Um, we also had attackers from Moscow, which I, this is before the whole Russian hacking thing. Um, he asked me, what the hell do I do with this? And I'm like, send me a screenshot and never talk of it again. And um, my favorite one was this attacker. Um, notice that Honey Badger will pull like user agent strings. It'll also pull the username that ran it and the host name of the computer system. So this was a student that was attacking one of our sites at uh, Pepperdine University. And um, he was, it actually put a pin right on top of his dorm. And we, we called up the dorm and we're like, hey, can I talk to Chris? And the guy's like, Chris, uh, which Chris? I'm like, uh, snooze? Snoozy, yeah. Forwards me onto his phone, it rings a couple of times. And all of a sudden, you know, you know, you know Chris answers the phone, he's like, hello? So we kind of freaked out a little bit there. And I kind of explained to him, it's like, you're trying to break into our systems. We've tracked your IP address. We know exactly where you're at. And uh, your host name is this. This is your username. And he's kind of freaking out. He's like, oh, I can't get kicked out of school, man. I can't get kicked out of school. And I'm like, well, we probably learned a lesson here, didn't we? Um, and uh, and uh, then at the end, he asked me for an internship, which I thought was weird. Yeah. Did I hire him? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> you got to get a bad guy to run it, though. See, that's the trick. Um, you got to make them think that they got a VNC server. You got to make them think that they got some type of network user authentication or an SSL VPN. It just, and it's got to be someplace that your normal users don't get to. Like robots.txt, disallow, no index, no follow, the admin directory. Your users aren't going to go to the admin directory. Where's the first place a bad guy's going to go? I'm going to go to the admin directory. So years and years ago, um, I, uh, I got invited out to work with a big scary bank in Germany. And in case you guys are wondering, all banks in Germany are big scary banks. <laughs> Every single one of them. Um, so this one invited us out to do some active defense stuff and we also pen tested um, uh, some credential management stuff for them. And, um, <laughs> and the, the, the equivalent of a CIO for the group that we were working in was like, no idiot is going to run this, right? at all. We're going to set this up. We're going to run it. Now, it was kind of funny when we went there. Uh, we went to Frankfurt, and my wife bought the hotel. She got the plane tickets, and we took our entire family, all of our kids. It was one of those things. It was over Thanksgiving, so I sent them a bid that was way high, and they came back, and they're like, so that's euros, right? We accept. And I'm like, yes. Because <laughs> euros are like 150% of a US dollar, so my whole family comes. And my wife's all excited. And she got us set up at the hotel. We get off the uh, train coming out of the, uh, uh, out of the airport. And uh, we're walking around with like, you know, cell phones. And it's like, turn right down this street. And I look down the street and it's all like pink lights. I'm like, hmm, no. Um, turn around and go back. I'm like, oh, God. My wife had found a deal of a hotel. And the hotel was in the red light district. It was actually called an hotel. You had to buzz to get into the hotel. You had to push a button, and like the lady would be like, "What do you want?" I'm like, "Oh, we got reservations here." She's like, 
She says on the intercom, oh my God, you have children. <laughs> so we go up and we check into this hotel and the lady's like, oh, oh my God, oh, oh my God, you have kids. Uh, uh, wait right here. We've got to go put new carpet in your room. <laughs> so we sat there for like an hour. She fed my family. She was extremely nice. And her husband went and put brand new carpeting down. And she gave us two rooms that were actually connected to each other. Uh, we got into the hotel rooms. There's like bars on the windows. And it was just, uh, you know, I'm just like freaking out. And I was like, thank God my wife was the one that booked the room. Because if I would have booked it, I, there's no way I'd live that down. Although here I am telling the story for like the 20th time. Um, so, uh, so we went in. We got settled in. And all of a sudden the lady comes into our room, busts into the room. She looks at my wife, looks at the kids, looks at us, runs up, and unplugs the televisions in both rooms. She's like, don't let the kids watch TV. And leaves. <laughs> so... So we spent, a, we spent a week or two weeks in Frankfurt, and uh, it was awesome. It was great. Every time we'd leave the hotel, there'd be like, you know, ladies and men, they'd be like, hey, you looking for a good time? And my kids are like, yes, we are. Yes, we are. <laughs> we're like, no, we're not. Um, so still to this day, when we're at family functions, the kids would be like, hey, dad, do you remember that time you took us to the red light district in Frankfurt, and we stayed there for two weeks? <laughs> oh, God, I want to kill him so bad. Um, <laughs> So we ran Honey Badger for a week, and this guy was like, no one would ever run it. And we got this many pins. <laughs> we took all of these ASNs for each one of these IP addresses, and then we did a lookup on how many of their systems on the inside of the network were communicating to any of these ASNs. And they found four systems that were compromised on the inside of their network that all of their security products missed. I had a question. Is this not threat intelligence? Is this threat intelligence you buy from a can from somebody else? Not even close. Threat intelligence can have value, but it has to be something that you create. We can create traps for attackers. We can. And we can do it legally. And we can do it intelligently. And you know what? This is fun. This isn't waiting for the next breach to clean up. We also have Jar Combiner, which allows you to merge uh, Honey Badger with absolutely any other Java application that you want. And it's free. Go run it. So, as I said, I'd make you guys kind of uncomfortable and uh, kind of close out. We're looking at security and as bad as it is, and it is bad. I think it's hilarious whenever people are talking about what the Russians did, and they're like, the Russian spearfish Podesta, they're, they're the only people that are lead enough to do that. I'm like, really? <laughs> Five seconds with the social engineering toolkit, and you too can recreate this exact same attack. What the hell? People are waking up to just how bad it is, but I don't think they know just how bad it is yet because it's worse, right? So is it time to pray? So I'm gonna give you guys a prayer, and I like this because a lot of people get really uncomfortable whenever we start talking about prayer, their butts clench up, and they're like, oh my God, he's gonna give us religion. Um, but I think this is a prayer everybody can get behind. God, grant me the serenity to accept the people that will not secure their networks. <laughs> the courage to face them um, when they blame me for their problems, and the wisdom to go out drinking afterwards, and I think that that's true. A.P. Delci came up with that. I love it. This, this is an invitation, folks. ADHD is just the start. I need ideas. You guys come up with crazy cool ideas for active defense. That's what we need. Go see what we got. Come up with ideas. Send them to us. I got a fleet of flying monkey interns. Um, I suck at capitalism. Almost everything I do gets fed back into ADHD and Rita. They cost nothing at all. I want to say thank you very much. Um, you guys got my contact info here. And uh, one more thing, we do free webcasts all the time if you guys want to register. We have an EEP URL there, and we also have QR codes because you guys totally trust that. And with that, that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. Okay. Okay, sounds good.